Hi there, welcome along to a Racing Post a coronavirus update. I'm Bruce Millington and I'm joined to discuss the latest situation with Lee Mottershead and David Jennings. David, we'll start with you. Those Irish meetings that have been such a godsend in terms of providing us with some action and, and, and you know, just keeping the show on the road. Ground to a halt yesterday, didn't they, when uh, when the Taoiseach announced a, a more stringent clamping down in a bid to stop the virus. They were, they were good meetings, though, isn't it? It was great to have something to, to, to actually watch and enjoy and bet on, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, it was it was terrific while it lasted, and it was it was very much day by day from talking to people. It was always we weren't looking a week in advance. It was always just a day ahead, and and just hoping we get through the day. And uh, it was inevitable that it was going to happen. It was just gradually getting uh, tighter and tighter all the time. And and while it worked brilliantly while it lasted, I think it is the right thing to do. I think I think public perception counts for a lot in racing. I really do, and I just think. It didn't look that good for racing to be continuing when so many people were going through such terrible times. And, you know, we got, what, 10 days out of it and it went really well. And uh, I think we should just be, be glad that we got that out of it. So, Lee, just summarise where we are now, which is almost entire global racing um, shutdown. But there, there is still some action if, if you look for it, isn't there? Yeah, there are small pockets. So we've lost Ireland. Um, we've obviously, we knew before we'd lost France, we'd lost Germany. Uh, we lost South Africa this week. They'll be uh, in lockdown from the end of this week. There was drama overnight in Australia when one industry p- uh, participant uh, discovered he'd been on a flight in which someone had tested positive for coronavirus. So uh, racing in Victoria was halted for two days. Um, they have stopped racing in New South Wales, certainly for tomorrow. And that's a big deal there because we're right on the cusp of their massive autumn programme. They got through the Golden Slipper meeting last weekend when Tom Marquand and William Haggis had two Group 1 winners, but they've got three massive Saturdays coming up. So, yeah, all around the world, it feels like this is is closing in now and there's a a horrible unity um, to what we're all going through. And if we look at... Meetings now that that suddenly become in deeper and deeper doubt. I mean, obviously, there's, there's going to be no Grand National. We, we we know that for sure. I mean, I, I read a trainer saying that he's he's hoping to to get a horse fit and well for Punches Town. But I mean, DJ, just take us through the situation in Ireland. But obviously, no one knows what's going to happen. But I think we can pretty much take it as a given that the Punches Town's in massive danger, can't we? Yeah, the first of them, I suppose, the Irish Grand National, which was supposed to be in Ferry House from the April 11th, April 13th, like that looks gone now. Obviously, it can't be held on the day that it was supposed to be on over Easter. The chances of rescheduling that are very, very slim, given the, the small proportion of the season that you could have. Um, Punches Town, like the 19th of April is the soonest anything will happen over here. And the 19th of April is probably is probably wishful thinking, if, I, if I'm being completely honest. I would say Conor Neal and the team at Punchestown are thinking themselves, if it does happen, it's almost guaranteed to happen behind closed doors because if racing does come back, I don't think it's just going to be all jam-packed crowds back into all the race course. I think it's going to be a gradual process and I think we're going to be almost working backwards from where we were and I think it's going to go behind closed doors and then hopefully come late summer and autumn, there might crowds. But uh, yeah, I, I think Punch 10 is in serious doubt. Um, 19th of April, it might seem like a long time away, but it's really not. It's it's three and a half weeks. And uh, I don't know, I would really fear for Punch 10. I think, I think I know the national hunt season in Britain is over, but I'd really fear for it in Ireland as well. That's just being completely honest. I'm only guessing and we're all guessing here, but um, I'd be absolutely shocked if Punch 10 went ahead. And Lee, in terms of, of Britain, you know, I think, we, you know, you've even got to kind of cast your, your telescope as far ahead as Royal Ascot here, haven't you, and start raising question marks? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this really is how long it is a piece of string. I mean, I, the, the problem is at the minute, nobody has any real idea, any meaningful idea when this will end. We're all guessing that's all we can do. But realistically, I would be very surprised. If we had a Guineas, if we had a Derby, if we had a Royal Ascot um, in their expected slots, it just seems too much of a leap of faith to think that we're going to get there. And I think that leads you to think, what will ha- what will we have of, of this whole flat season? How much of this flat season will actually happen? Well, if we you look at it, Lee, 
Lee, I mean, I guess if you're looking at the priorities, it would be to have a classic season, wouldn't it? So you'd say, look, we're going to push back and we will definitely, ha- we, we need to have just for the kind of, I don't know, the purity of the pattern or, or, or the continuity or whatever else, you need a Guineas and you need a Derby and, and you need the Phillies equivalents, don't you? And then... Well, I, I think what you'd say is you ideally would have a Derby and a Phillies equivalent, et cetera. The problem is, realistically, we don't need anything. We we, 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 we we get what we're given to an extent. These are such unprecedented circumstances. I don't think we can say we need anything. We would no, like... No, for sure. Sorry. And I'm certainly, yeah, I mean, I'm just talking in comparative, you know, yeah. terms to, what, to what's going on outside. But I mean, you know, if you were to say, well, look, the window, the, the flat season is going to operate from July 1 onwards, let's say. Yeah. I'm yeah. saying you, you then have to basically rip up what you've, what you've had, don't you? And say, look, these, yeah. these are the things... We, if time allows that we we would like and then anything else is a kind of nice to have isn't it yeah i think that's right i think in an ideal so in an ideal world you do have that and there there could be this we're all trying to find things to cling on to to for reasons to be hopeful things to look forward to and i think if we if we're going down that line what we could say in the best case scenario in terms of the racing year the racing program there could be some weird novelty value to having a derby in August, a Guineas in mid-July, you know, the Kentucky Derby in September. Um, so I, I think that will be that will be the aim. And um, obviously everything that happens in racing is connected to Bloodstock because that's where the horses come from. And they're in a similar position. If you if you're someone at the minute that would that has that a pin hooker that bought, bought um, a yearling to sell as a two-year-old at a breeze up sales across you know across the, the early spring. You're in a situation whereby you have a horse that you wanted to sell as a precocious two-year-old to be sold for, in the ideal world, to get to Royal Ascot. The value of that horse has been decimated because there ain't going to be, in all probability, um, preco- precocious juveniles this year because there's been no races for precocious juveniles. Anyone that has a horse to sell is in a, in a really precarious position because even when we have a situation whereby horses can be sold and races can be run, we're going through a financial crisis, the likes of which we've not experienced in our lifetime. So will there be people there to buy the horses? I think at the, the minute, um, and I, I, we discussed this yesterday off, off air, like that I think the main thing is to try and get racing back in some form, um, whether that's a regional form of racing, um, whether that's based around certain training centres. But what I've been doing the last few days is working on a piece looking back at the the foot and mouth outbreak of 2001 and how racing reacted to that to try and find um, lessons that we learned and reasons to be hopeful. And, and one thing they did do there was racing came back in a very creative form. It was in pockets. It was where race courses wanted to stage races. Um, it, it, the, the, there had to be a degree of ingenuity showed about racing coming back. And I think that will be the same with this. We're not just going to be able to bring back racing in Britain, racing in Ireland. It's going to have to be very cleverly thought through in terms of how we do it. But that does give us a precedent that things can be done, albeit the circumstances here are very different and much more dire. Sure. And David, I mean, this, you know, we've, we've kind of digested the, the top line um, effects of, 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 of the virus, both in terms of, you know, the, the main issue, which is the effects it's having on, on people's health and, you know, the tragic fatality numbers but within the relatively irrelevant but still to us important world of racing there's so many elements to this isn't there you know and and, and everywhere you look you're seeing things happen that you, you you just wouldn't have expected and you know one one effect of it is and we, we there was a piece in the racing post today about ruth carr kind of taking 55 of her horses out of training and, and just to save the owner's costs i mean i guess that's going to become a commonplace thing isn't it Oh, yeah, it's going to be massive. Like, I'm due to talk to Gordon Elliott today just about what's happening in his table. And it's going to be very strange for him because he has so many horses, like hundreds of horses, that the vast majority of them will be targeting at the Spring Festival's Fairy House, Punchestown. And even he would usually have raids to air an entry as well. So there's a lot of horses in training there, a lot of staff. So he needs to decide now whether he just, you know, stops everything and just takes it that the season is over and that means a lot of staff laid off and um you know a lot of a lot of people not being paid 
Um, or else he says, right, 19th of April is where we're targeting for. That's the date. And we'll hope that punch 10 goes ahead. So trainers are in a really tricky situation because I think the 19th of April is, is a kind of in-between date because it's obviously over three weeks away. But do you say to yourself, right, we have to go by the guidelines at the moment, which suggests that punches 10 will be on because the 19th of April is before the punches 10 festival starts or do you take the chance and say look there's not a chance of this going ahead so trainers are in a really tricky situation at the moment I'm going to speak to some of them today and just see what approach they're taking I'd imagine for a lot of them it will be a wait and see approach but that's going to cost them a lot of money because they're paying staff they're paying bills they're paying vets bills and there's going to be no prize money coming in from punches 10 and the massive festival so it's really really strange situation but the only the only thing i will say it is the same for everybody no matter who you talk to in any walk of life everybody is feeling and experiencing pain at the moment so it's just it's just one of these once in a lifetime things that's going to happen and uh, you know you just have to try and look at the bigger picture it's going to be very hard for a lot of people but um you just have to try and hope that come like when this happened i thought it was harder on the National Hunt people because I was thinking all the spring festivals were cancelled. But I think the National Hunt people have done well to get so much out of the season. And now we're looking at the flat and thinking to ourselves, do you know what? Is there going to be any type of flat season at all? And now I actually feel more sorry for the flat, for the flat people. So, look, Bruce, it's, it's just a terrible situation, really. Yeah, it is. And only really worrying is that some of the racing-related charities are feeling the pinch. Obviously, the Animal Health Trust is... You know, in dire straits and, and retired Greyhound Trust aren't homing at the moment. You know, it's a really, really stressful time for, for those fantastic organisations, isn't it? It absolutely is. I mean, on, on the one hand, on the one side, you, you, you hope that you, this sense of public public desire to help that, you, that we're seeing with this, um, the, the Go Sam project to get volunteers into International Health Service at the moment will we'll sort of flow through into the racing chariots and people won't forget them. But the reality is that the a huge chunk of people will be seeing their income either stopping or being reduced over the, the coming weeks. And when that happens, I think a lot of us, you know, when you look at your your standing orders on your on your on your on your bank, you'll find that you've got a, a probably a handful of charities to which you make um, donations to every month. I know I do now, you know. We're lucky we're still in employment. But for those people who aren't, who are having their employment reduced, inevitably, you've got to put food on the table. And charities might well be a sector which are really hard hit um, by this. And you say the Animal Health Trust, they're, in a site, they're, they're linked to this, but they've got other issues there as well. But we all remember what they did last year with the equine flu crisis and how vital they were. To the testing um, of, of all the all the samples, and we've not mentioned race courses yet. We had a story um, in the Racing Post that, that, that went up yesterday on, on the on the site and on the app about um, Newbury's predicament, whereby obviously they they've lost their big spring trials meeting in April. They're probably unlikely to get the the, the locking gym maybe more afterwards, and, and they've they've seen that their insurance policy doesn't cover. Um, the coronavirus. So because it was renewed in January, when everyone knew that this was potentially on the horizon in some form, the, their insurance policy doesn't cover them for meetings abandoned because of this. And there will surely be other race courses in that boat as well. So if you have a meeting to which your business is largely dependent and you can't get insurance because of the reason it's, it's fallen, they're going to be in dire straits. So as David says, this affects everybody. Um, it affects every sector within this country and within Ireland, and it affects every country. It's a horrible thing to say, but we're all in this this, this miserable boat. Absolutely. Um, really interesting piece by Anna Maria Phelps, the um, chair chair of the B, uh, BHA in the Racing Post today, and she, they put out a general statement yesterday. And I thought it, was, it showed terrific leadership on her part. It was a really really strong message, and it touched on just mental health issues uh, for everyone in racing. And you know, again. For both of you, on, on, on you know, in Britain and in Ireland, this is going to be a huge issue, isn't it? And this is where racing welfare under Dawn Goodfellow do such a fantastic job over here. But I think you know, racing's participants, DJ, are a hardy lot. But you know, we've we've seen in the past that there there is you know a, a link as there is in all, all walks of life with with mental health issues. And 
you know, again, that's going to be a critical issue in the coming weeks, isn't it? It's going to be massive, Bruce. Uh, absolutely massive. I find with racing people, it's such a bubble. Like we we saw it ourselves at Cheltenham, and there there we see that for four days when we're completely in the zone. And you might be trying to pick winners, and you're doing podcasts, and you're writing race reports, and doing previews. You're completely in the zone for those four days, and you might say that we're in it for a lot of the year. But you have to put yourselves in their position where they're doing this day in, day out, where they're completely in the zone. They have a routine. They're up at six o'clock in the morning. They're riding out every morning. They have a strict regime every single day, and that's completely gone now. And for, for jockeys as well, like how are they going to be able to maintain this ridiculous weight that they need to do to have rides, not knowing when they're going to be riding again? So usually I'd imagine flat jockeys during the winter, they can, they can let themselves put on a few pounds and, and eat better than they're allowed to do during the season. And they probably give themselves a target, right, I'll go back training in, in February or, or late January. But what do they do now? Because they don't really know when they're back. So they, they try and stick to their diet, which is which is very hard to do for, for a long period of time. Or do they say to themselves, right, I'm going to go, I, I, I'm going to, you know, let go for a couple of weeks and then come back. It, it's really, really tough. And like for, for stable staff working in the yards, that is their whole life. Like they dedicate, they're, they're different to... I would I would suggest people will argue with this. I would say they're different to every walk of life. Every single thing that they have is geared towards horses and the care of those horses and everything to do with horses. And for that to be taken away from them, it's a huge, huge blow. And not to know when it's coming back. Uh, yeah, as you say, Bruce, mental health is going to be absolutely massive in the next couple of weeks. And for people, I would say talk as much as you can and, and you know, stay in contact with people, FaceTime, Skype, all this kind of stuff is going to be huge over the coming weeks, I think. Lee, it's something you've written about a lot, uh, mental health within racing, you know, in, in better times, in, in such a testing environment as this, you know, the focus is going to be huge on it. What what can people do if they, you know, if, they, if they're stressed and they're worried about paying bills and they're just, you know, the whole general situation? I mean, there, there are people in racing who are here to help, aren't they? Yeah, there absolutely are. And th- that is one thing that, that, that in some way separates this crisis from previous racing shutdowns, even as recent as footmouth in 2001 there wasn't that that same support network that there is now and the massive changes if you're a if you're a jockey you've got um, a fantastic um 24 hour helpline that you can access through through the pga as you said racing welfare bruce they do a tremendous service you, you can contact them there are people out there and i'd absolutely echo what what david said about um, speak to people but the, the thing about racing it's a very gregarious sport um, it is as David said it, it exists within a bubble and one of the comforts is you see the same people maybe not on a daily basis but certainly on a regular basis it, it's not a sport in which people are generally used to working from home or, or existing from home they're not used to really being being trapped within their four walls and maybe nipping out once a day so I think as a community, a racing community, that, that this is a very strange existence, more so than perhaps a, a lot of other different sectors. And I think for, for everybody in that community, it really is important that they reach out to people, that they don't just sit on their own and, and they talk to people, they, they use Skype, they use FaceTime, they use their phones. And you can guarantee that if, if there's someone sat at home thinking, you know, I could really do with, with talking to somebody, that the people they want to talk to are almost certainly in the same boat. Um, we are all in it together, and we have to remember that, and we have to use each other for our collective benefit. And one thing I'd say, uh, both of you chaps, is that, you know, I think racing Twitter is, is, you know, it can be a pretty venomous cutthroat place at times, but, I mean, I think this is a time for all the people who work in racing and love racing to come together on Twitter and, and have some conversations, you know I mean? You know, a lot of us are going to have a lot of time on our hands now. And, you know, jump on and, and fire questions the way to Lee. What's your favourite horse, DJ? Who's going to win China next year? And, you know, and if you are a, a David Jennings or, <clears throat> or a Nick Luck or a Lee Modsett or any of the people who've got a personality in the phone, answer everybody. That would be my plea to everyone. I mean, I always try to do it anyway, but I know there's some people on Twitter who, unless, you know, the person tweeting them has got a blue tick or whatever, they're not interested. But I think it is... I think it's really important for all of us to create a really nice community and just, you know, make sure that if you love your racing and you're sitting at home and you, you know, this self-isolation is going to be so difficult. 
you can jump on there and start a conversation and, and you, you're entitled to an answer. So I hope that the racing Twitter community pulls together and, and, and really kind of make sure that the people who are, you know, could do with some communication and some contact, damn well get it. I mean, DJ, just one thing as a punter now, I mean, what, you know, what do you do here? I mean, there's, there's bits and pieces on, but you've, you've really got to go out and find it, haven't you? Yeah, I, I would have no interest in finding it. I, I, I personally, I don't like betting on things that I don't have any information on or don't have any knowledge of. So, to be honest, um, it, it, on that regard, I'm not too worried about not being able to have a bet. It doesn't bother me too much. I know there will be people who who will say it, it will, but um, yeah, ju- just just take the break and you know enjoy this free time. And I think there is going to be a few positives coming out of this break. Like I think we're going to absolutely appreciate what we have when it comes back even more or so I think it's going to be it's going to be absolutely massive and you know you're getting to do things that that you probably never got to do before and I would say as regards like I, I'd say I've watched the ITV and racing TV coverage of Cheltenham certainly double figures I've watched every race at least 10 times from last year taking notes maybe do things like that look back at videos during the season you know touch wood like there's going to be a jump season next season so go back through videos if, if, if you're feeling the effects of no racing. Go back through videos, take notes. You know, this is your time to do all the research and you're going to have plenty of time. And uh, yeah, I, I, that's personally what, what, what I find myself doing is watching videos over and over again because that's what I enjoy. And obviously people will enjoy watching Netflix series. I'll do as well. But uh, yeah, there's plenty of time to do loads of different things, Bruce. I must I, 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 my, my uh, horse tracker as well. It's like the modern equivalent of a soft drawer. And there's a lot of horses on there that, that shouldn't be on there anymore. Lee, I mean, there is a slightly serious message, a very serious message with punters, isn't there? Because some people, while they would echo David's thoughts, they own, you know, that there's things they like to bet on, and if that's say horses and football, that's not available to them. But for some people, they like to have a bet because they like to have a bet. And I mean, I've done a piece in my column tomorrow just about the perils of maybe veering into areas like online casinos. It's very, very dangerous, isn't it? Yeah, it absolutely is, and you know we're we're fortunate as individuals. You know we will we will bet when we think there's a um, a horse, a football team, a Eurovision contest, song contest entry that it is is a is a good bet, but we don't have to do it. There are some people that feel compelled to do it, and regrettably there will inevitably be um, some organisations out in the um, the the online sphere who will seek to exploit that. Um, and again, as we've said before, we, we keep hammering home in, in, in Racing Post. There are organisations there to help. There is no need for anyone to have a bet. Um, and there's got to be a massive hope that in the, in the current situation where all the people's incomes are going to be hit very hard, that, that people use their money sensibly and wisely. And if they feel they need help, that they seek that help because it is there for them. Okay, on a slightly lighter note, DJ, is that have you got your initials on your T-shirt there? Does that actually say DJ on your top there? Yeah. This right, Why? Bruce. This comes from uh, uh, two years ago. We got to a football final, football championship final with Dunderry. So we all, when you get to it, like you get nothing in Gaelic football usually, but when you get to a final, you get everything. You get your socks, you get your shorts, okay. you get tracksuits. So we got our own uh, individual uh, T-shirts, and uh, mine says DJ. Yeah, and. Um, uh, not to go into the, the not go into the finer details of the final, but we drew the first match and then we were beaten in a replay, which was uh, very frustrating. Oh dear! Well, you've still got the T-shirt to prove it, DJ. I know that you've had a, a difficult time since Cheltenham with uh, the lovely Eva being pregnant, so you've decided to, to uh, isolate from one another. Uh, but I believe you're back in this. You've, you've done your, your time and you're back in the same house from Friday, and the baby's due very soon. I thought you were going to say back in the hot seat there, Bruce. Yeah, I'm back uh, back on Friday. Uh, two weeks. Well, it's actually more than two weeks now, given Cheltenham we've been apart. I think she's enjoying it far more than me. Uh, <laughs> although all I've been doing is just getting, all I've been doing is just getting fat. All I've been doing is eating constantly. When you go back to your mom's house after spending so long apart when you're used to cooking for yourself and then you're getting like dinners handed to you with like loaded potatoes and everything <laughs> and like I couldn't afford to get any fatter and I just have. So uh yeah, it's back, back, pounding the roads. Uh, although you're only allowed to go once, uh, back, pounding the roads now, Bruce. And Lee, how are you keeping yourself sane? Plenty of cooking, plenty of baking? Yeah, yeah, plenty of cooking. Um, I do need to do a bit more baking, but yeah, no, plenty of cooking. I've been doing a lot of sort of batch, batch cooking. So um, 
I made a, a large steak pie that went in the freezer the day. Um, I will be making cakes and biscuits because I enjoy doing that. I've been like Dave, I've been going out for exercise once a day. So yesterday, um, we've actually just moved out not far from Epsom Racecourse. So I cycled up Chalk Lane to the, the, the grandstands of the, the dive and then cycled back through Langley Vale. So that was, that was all good and um, got, the, got the blood pumping. And aside from that, really, taking a lot of ginger cat photos, um, uh, um, trying to pass the time. And the next few days, I'm sure... Adam, self-isolating with Julie. It's, 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 it's an experience like no other, David. Um, I think the next few days as well, I'll be doing... It's sort of what, what David says. He's looking back on Cheltenham. I'll be looking back on past Grand Nationals. Lovely stuff. David and Lee, thank you very much indeed. Thanks for watching. Don't forget, stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll be back soon with another coronavirus update.